Thank you very much. Um, this is awesome. Every time I give one of these talks and you see like the room get more and more full for people to hear about typography, it's just, it's really pretty awesome. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, some of you have seen me uh, talk before, or talked to me, um, seen other things that I've written, and, and I've tended to focus very much on um, the very the sort of the top-down, big picture of web typography and what it is and how to implement it well. And I, I really wanted to try and do something a little bit different and get a little closer to what we're all talking about. Um, and I think that this will uh, be a good introduction to building up from a very small foundation to see what can happen from there. So uh, a tiny little bit about me. Um, I tend to uh, focus a lot on the design that you can't necessarily see, um, but what really ends up happening mostly um, is I post photos about Tristan. So um, maybe I don't really get quite the same following as Naomi or um, even my daughter, who gets way more likes on her photos, and I don't even know how she does it. But um, I like to focus on something that um, I like to, that I like to call that smallest little piece and build everything around that. So for me, a small piece is in the morning uh, when I go and try to make a small piece of art. Um, and I have a good subject. He's, he's a pretty handsome fellow. But um, that's how I start my day, is I, I try and go out and I try and create something that's on a very small scale that adds up to a lot of wonderful connections. Um, so type and typography is sometimes a connection that's a little bit hard for people to get their head around and, and to think about how they can do really well on the web, but it's actually something that can form the basis of a great system for you to work around, even when you're not particularly versed in it and you don't feel really comfortable calling yourself a designer or really understanding what typography can do. Um, it's not about this layer of paint, and I, I'm, I'm not picking on Alex from yesterday, design is not paint, I'm not trying to dig there, but UX is not paint. It's not something that can just go across the top. It's something that's made up of a thousand little details that adds up to an emotional connection to the thing with which you're interacting. So, we start with our type because type are the clothes our words wear. And I think that's a wonderful visual sentiment. And it's really... Um, I think the basis for which we build everything around when we're building a website um, is we go back to the beginning and we think about uh, people like Luke Lubluski and Cameron Mall many years ago were writing about designing for mobile first because we all have these little devices in our pocket and we all have big ones on our laps and on the desk at home. Um, they're all different, but they have this one thing in common that the content has to work across all of them. So in thinking about designing for mobile first, you're really thinking about designing for content first, which is how Mark Bolton was talking about it back in 2011, designing from the content out, which when you think about it, when your content is quite often based in text, that means you're designing from the typography out, as Elliot J. Stocks wrote later that year. So we have to narrow our focus. We have to get in a little bit closer to the thing that really drives the basis of the design and the way that we can interact with something. And this is a website, an app, really any kind of digital product that we're talking about. We've all heard the phrase, a journey of a thousand step, uh, a thousand miles begins with a single step. Um, I, I found this as sort of the original uh, quote, and I thought that was a really beautiful sentiment, even if I didn't necessarily understand it fully. But I also know that when you translate that, a volume of a thousand lines is going to have to begin with a single P. So what else is going on? We have to see how does this sit in context with everything else that's going on in the web. So how do we find a parallel or a parallax, depending on your design philosophy? Um, what else is going on around the web? Well, we're designing in atomic patterns. We're building these libraries of user interface patterns, um, code module patterns, build systems that help us create consistencies by starting with small objects that can then be replicated. How do we do that with content? How do we apply that same level of systematic thinking when objects and code to text? So what is that smallest element? What is the basic primitive of content? It's not all of the pages in the book. 
It's not even a spread of pages in the book, or even a single one. It's smaller than that. It's that smallest chunk of content, that individual paragraph. So that's where we'll start. We're going to start our journey for building a great typographic system by coming to the very heart. So let's think about what a paragraph is conceptually. So it's been defined variously as a thought, an idea, in this case a very powerful one, or a basic unit of discourse that has a little bit more structure more to it, but still contained. That concept dates back to the ancient Greeks and the term paragraphos, and, that's a vi and that visual representation has changed over the years, and with each of those iterations in that visual representation, it affects meaning, and that meaning of how it's presented becomes increasingly tied to the content itself. So all of those different iterations in presentation affect how we take that content in. Each style is going to have an implication on readability, scannability, and flow. So we want to come back to something that is very often overlooked and left forlorn in our reset style sheet, but it, it doesn't have to be left alone like that. So here's an ancient Greek text. This is going back to Menander's Sicyonians in the third century BC. And you see little lines underneath many of the first characters there on some of those lines in this manuscript. And those lines indicate the beginning of a new thought or passage. So there's our first representation in written history that I could find about a paragraph being defined as a concept and through typography. We can do that today. Now I translate this for you, but it's all Greek to me. Um, Thank you, thank you. The last time I told that joke, not nearly so many people laughed. Uh, okay, so we, we can take this and we can represent it typographically in the same way, but that doesn't really give us a strong visual cue about where one passage ends and the other begins in a way that we can recognize and take in. Um, but if you wanted to, there's your CSS. There's your Unicode character, really simple. Make sure your, your paragraphs are positioned and then stick that little character underneath the beginning of it. Works really well. So let's flash forward about 1,500 years, and we see manuscripts. And what happened in manuscripts in the Middle Ages when they're being copied over and over and over again, scribes began to define a character to indicate that passage change. They still weren't doing a line break, but they were at least adding something in there that became fairly uniform and something that we can understand today. That's a symbol that we see fairly regularly. And I have encountered it often in page layout programs, but then one day I opened up my email in the morning and I looked at my daily mail from Medium, and lo and behold, right there is a pilcro. And what they've done very cleverly in this email is they have taken the paragraph breaks out, displayed them in line in that teaser, but left the pilcro in place so that I can see that this is a line break, this is a, a, a pause in that teaser that's been condensed into an area that fits in my email. So I don't even really think about it. I actually had been receiving that email for weeks before I ever noticed that that character was there. I thought that was a very clever little way of dealing with this. So again, this is something else. It's a standard character. We could represent our paragraphs this way, and it's not very hard to do. So we display our paragraphs in line, and we add our content after this time with that Unicode for the Pilcro. It's included in almost every font, so we can use that wherever we like. Um, when you're representing teasers in uh, news pages or in emails, that might be an interesting thing to start to do. Now later, we started to see something that would break down to the next line, and we'd start to see indenting. So here's the first more modern way of seeing this, and now this dates to the end of the 15th century, and by most accounts, that indent, that space left there, was actually for the illustrators to go back in these newly printed things, this whole brand new printing press idea, and put in illustrated capitals at the beginnings of these new passages. And what ended up happening was we were printing faster and faster and they couldn't keep up, so eventually they just left the space there. So that's how we really ended up with that. And this is something that we're all very familiar with by looking at books. And you see there's a nice little indent there. And that was formalized by a fellow named Robert Bringhurst in a book that some of you may have heard of called The Elements of Typographic Style. And I think he was very famously described what he thought about this in something like that manner. 1M. Naturally, 
here's how your CSS might look here. So that was a different style of reading. That was meant for books, longer form passages of copy that you don't want to interrupt your flow by having a break. But what ended up happening around the 50s and 60s, we were all starting to use, well, when I say we, me maybe, but probably not too many other people in this room, um, we use typewriters. So there's two different ways that you could indicate a paragraph. You could hit the return key and then hit the tab key, two different motions, or laziness starts to creep in, hit return twice. So that's where we start to see this convention come to play. Now, that actually works in our favor on the web because it increases scannability. So as your eyes traveling down the page, it's a little bit easier to find one concept to the next, one thought to the next, because we have a visual break there. So that little bit of fate actually came uh, in and as an assistance, led us to the sort of CSS and structure that we see in our reset files all the time that looks something like that. That's where a lot of people stop. And I'd like us to consider it a little bit more. And so now we're going to dig a little bit deeper inside the paragraph itself. So if we have this basic decision, how do we want to separate it or bring it together based on what people want to do with it. But let's look inside and try and deal with every editor's nightmare, the orphan. What do we do about that one word that gets bumped down to the next line? Editors slave over this in manuscripts and, pub and publications all the time, and it's increasingly impossible to deal with that on the web, or so we might think. Because as we all know, screen sizes change. So that can be a real challenge in a content management system. You don't know how often the content will change, and you don't know how wide the screen is that someone's going to be consuming it on. So how do we do that? Well, there's actually a couple of ways. We can use something like a JavaScript library to handle it, or we could use something on the server depending on what content management system it is. But the heart of it is the old standby and non-breaking space. The challenge is to do it in a systematic way. So here we're using Widow Tamer, and that screenshot was just recorded on my laptop. And um, what that does is, using JavaScript, it will explode every paragraph and look for a minimum of 10 characters at the end, and then insert a non-breaking space, and it triggers it on a resize. So anytime somebody changes the screen, it's going to go and look at that paragraph and make sure that there's a nice little chunk of text on the last line. Now, a lot of people are hesitant to put that amount of JavaScript in, but that really depends on what your environment is. If you're using Drupal as a content management system, there's actually a module called Typography that will, on the server side, insert that non-breaking space before the content is ever served to the end user, and that way you can be sure that it's going to happen without adding any overhead to the delivery of that page. So I encourage you to check that out if you use Drupal. There is a, mod, a plugin for WordPress as well, but it's a little bit out of date. Looking a little bit further into the paragraph, we look at line endings. And you can see that that is a typical flush left, rag right, so you can see the uneven line endings on, on the right-hand side. But the word spacing is beautiful, it's perfect, so we don't really want to impact that. Some people decide that they would rather have a consistent line ending, so they try justifying, which is just one line of CSS, it's easy to do, but I think it produces a lot of uneven spacing between those words. The term rivers is what you uh, talk about in the design world. And the problem is, hyphenation is not very well handled on the web. We can even it out some, but there are a few things that we have to do. So if we were to get hyphenation working and we wanted to use justification, that's better. The spacing's definitely better than it was before, but it still is a little bit forced. I'd much rather go with that ragged right with hyphenation, and you can see that that has a much more even right-hand edge than it was in the first slide and it preserves all the word spacing. And you can see that really gets exacerbated on small screens, where you can see we've done nothing here, and it's got very uneven, choppy line lengths based on the length of the words. Justified, it looks even worse. We get the hyphenation going, and it makes either one of these solutions quite manageable on a small screen. So it really gives a much better reading experience. This takes a little bit more effort because we have a lot of different ways hyphenation is handled. The problem is, 
Chrome and Opera actually ship with hyphenation built into the browser, but no hyphenation dictionary. I don't know why that is, but it is. So we need to find our own way. There's the hyphenator library with, uh, in JavaScript that can help turn that on. But again, that's probably something you'd want to scope only the browsers that really need it. And that takes a little bit more effort. It's not impossible, but it is something to keep in mind as far as performance is concerned. So let's look in even a little bit closer. Let's get into one of those classic styles of paragraphs at beginning, uh, beginning chapters, etc., that we've seen in great design, the drop cap. It's a beautiful thing. A lot of people have a hard time doing this on the web. Now, there have been ways that people are doing it, but oftentimes it requires the insertion of special classes. And now we're thinking about systems here, so we can't do that. All of the things that I'm talking about in this, in this presentation really are things that don't require additional markup. That's the whole goal. It can survive as, as a system intact in any content management system without the editor having to go in and wrap things with a class. So how do we do that on the web? Well, as it happens, Bobby Loco not only likes drop caps, but he likes web standards because he's got his blue beanie on. And so in his design here, now this is straight off the web, mind you. This is a, a homies character, and I looked up how to draw him, and I thought that was great. So um, this is how he did his C CSS. It takes a little bit more effort, but this will, in combination with conditional HTML classes added for older versions of IE, allow you to style this anywhere without a single extra class or wrapper in that markup. So using the pseudo selector first of type and first letter, the first paragraph and the first letter of that paragraph will be highlighted in any way you see fit. And if it's less than IE9, you can use the first letter pseudo selector and have to chain that with an adjacency. So it's the first paragraph after an H1 or something like that. And that will allow you to style it pretty much anywhere. And again, the fallback is that it's just regular text. So it's, it's a very um, transparent thing to add, but that really amplifies the style of what you're presenting. Um, there are other ways to highlight a new passage or a section that you're trying to introduce, and that's by adding a bold first line. But how do you do that in a content management system when everything's changing? Well, it turns out we have that at our, at our disposal too. So even as this screen gets wider, we can see it automatically is bolding everything there very simply using the first line pseudo selector. So again, a really easy little trick to add greater style and sophistication or elegance to the presentation of text without adding a lot of effort on the part of the people who are maintaining it. So further and further into the paragraph we go, how about links? Links are just the, the orphan stepchild, not the other orphan, but this one, um, that nobody ever thinks about. And you look at that in Chrome, and that is really ugly. So we have a beautiful typeface with this really coarse, thick, heavy underline. WebKit's doing a little bit better job, but that's only in WebKit, and Chrome is far more popular these days. So how do we make this better? Well, one of the things that we've tried to do is actually go with a border bottom. So, you know, this is spaced out a little bit further than it needs to be, but you take my point there. There's only so much you can do. So we tried to get a little bit more sophisticated and make it a dotted line. So that looked a little bit better. It was a little bit less intrusive. But when Medium came along, and I looked at what they were doing with their links, it was really beautiful and almost what I thought was just right. So I set about taking what they had done on their site and tried to improve on it a little bit, and I came up with something that looks like this. And you can see it's a, it's a, it's a lighter weight line that's tucked up nicely underneath the letters, and it has nice breaks around the descenders. And I think it has a much more graceful way of, of creating a link that stands out, it's accessible, it's easy to create fallbacks for it if it doesn't, it's not supported in other browsers. It's a background gradient and a white text shadow. And CSS looks something like that. It's a little bit more complicated. You have to deal with retina displays and a few other things, but there's a mix in for that. So use SAS and I'll give you a link to some code later and you can play around with it yourself. It's really not that hard. I created it so that I just pass in one line and say this is the background color, the foreground color, and just do your thing. And it works out really well. So we want to do these things to add a little grace, a little bit of beauty to the reading experience. Because increasingly, we're dealing with a paperless world. We're dealing with iPads. We're dealing with an Amazon that has been selling more ebooks than print ones since 2011. 
So more and more, what we have for a reading experience is what we have on screen. We want to take care to preserve the quality of that experience, so it's not just getting by. There are other things that we can do. Increasingly, we have what are called open type features available to us in typefaces on the web, where rather than having just a standard italic or, or whatever the typefaces we've chosen, we want to get some of those nicer characters, the ligatures, the connecting lines between an F and an F or an S and a T that really add a little bit of extra polish to what we're presenting. Those things are also able to be added with a line or two of CSS as long as the typeface supports it and it falls back to just standard text, so you're not really losing anything other than a little bit of file size in the typeface itself. And that CSS, again, thanks to browser prefixing, looks more complicated than it is. There's another mix-in for that. I'm going to come back to this a lot. I have a whole ton of stuff available for you up on GitHub, and I'll have a link to that main repository at the end of the presentation. So that kind of brings us to one of the most exciting things that I wanted to get at. And so you'll see on the screen right now that what makes the whole experience? Nothing. What happens when we're waiting for those web fonts to load this excruciatingly long time? Thank you, web browser vendors. You have gone against the web's grain. Shame on you. They've implemented a timeout for web fonts before they will show you something in the fallback, in some cases not ever showing you anything at all. There are some versions of Safari that have an infinite wait. That's documented, and that's shameful. So, how do we fix that? We want to make sure that we actually encourage the flash of unstyled text so that we can then move on to styling said unstyled text. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to tie into the Google Web Font Loader. Oh, that's right. This is even better. Um, so, today is the 155th birthday of the U.S. Postal Service, the uh, Pony Express. This Google Doodle that was on this morning. And so rather than waiting for the Pony Express to deliver our web fonts, we would rather do something that makes a little bit more sense. Um, so rather than Pony Express, maybe we'll go forward a little bit more and we'll try out Carrier Pigeons. Back in 2009, thanks to Jacqueline, she took me into this last night. Um, this test was done, and apparently our web fonts could be delivered faster than the South African telecom company's internet data was being provided. Um, we could still do better and use the Google Web Font Loader instead, so that we insert a class in the page during that loading process that allows us to call that non-web font styled text, and we'll have a little bit faster loading experience, and then it's going to snap into the web font. So it's a little jarring. It's not exactly what we want, but we get content on the screen a heck of a lot faster. And that's really what our goal is, get the content on the screen. Because what happens when the connection drops and the web font never loads? They don't get your content at all. It's not going to happen, and that's really unacceptable. That's not what the web is all about. The web is about delivering content. It's really arrogant of us as designers and developers to hold that content hostage, so we want to make sure we don't do that. So the best thing we can do is use that loading process and tune up those fallback fonts so that there's even less reflow. And we can almost eliminate it, maybe not exactly, but we can almost eliminate it by making sure that we use the loading CSS like so. There's our normal CSS. That class gets injected in the page by the web font loader. So as soon as that class is injected, our, our content will show up because we're not calling a web font in that second stanza. And then as soon as the web fonts have loaded, that class gets removed and it reflows. So letter spacing, word spacing, line height, margins, font size, all of those things we can use to fine tune what it looks like when the web font's not present. It's very important and it's very, very simple. The web font loader's been around since 2010. It's just a matter of our getting used to taking a little bit of extra time at the end of the project. And in a lot of that stuff that I have online, I include a little button that you can throw in the page to toggle those classes and turn the web fonts on and off so you can play around with this yourself and get it just right. So this brings us to a question about what the perfect paragraph is. The answer is really what's right for your project, because I don't know what your project is, but you do, and you need to think about its intended use. 
So let's look at some of those intended uses. So the Seattle Times was recently redesigned by Mike Montero and his company, um, Mule Studio, Mule Design. Um, they did a wonderful job, a, a bold intro paragraph to set the tone of the piece and give you the, what it's all about. Then they've got a generous break in between because as any good journalist knows, you want to write things in chunks that people can easily take in, guiding them through the story most important to sustaining details. Perfectly appropriate design. Now if we take a look at BuzzFeed, we know that this is also perfectly appropriate design. Big, bold, widely spaced, bite-sized chunks so you know exactly what's going on in Taylor Swift's dating life. That is exactly what that site's all about, so that's just fine. Now, for me, what really draws me in is a beautiful reading experience, because that's something that I'm always looking for. I read a lot of things online, and, and I really want to see um, an inviting experience there. So Frank Camaro's book, The Shape of Design, you can read online, and I think he's done a gorgeous job of typesetting this and setting it up in a way that it's very easy to read. It's a beautiful typeface. It's a slightly soft color contrast on there. Um, the letting stays consistent, and you've got just a nice little indent for each paragraph. So it doesn't disturb the flow. It doesn't intrude on the experience of reading. That's what it's all about. So really, the only wrong answer to that question is no answer at all. Thank you very much. So in case you're curious, Salome and Scala Sands were the two typefaces I used in that presentation. Salome, you can find online at salomefont.com. Um, it's a pay-what-you-want kind of download. It's absolutely gorgeous. You should definitely check it out. And a big thanks to Dan Mall for pointing that one out a while back. Um, and in, in case you were uh, curious about the photography, that's my morning dog walk. Um, I wrote a book about all of this stuff. Um, I have a few to give away for really good questions. Students, nudge, nudge. Um, uh, the slides here are already up on SlideShare, so if you go to slideshare.net to Jay Pommentel, everything's there. Um, all the code, github.com slash Jay Pommentel, is the theme here. Um, and then if you're interested in the book, you can find that on O'Reilly by going to bit.ly.com slash rwtbook. I'd love to answer some questions. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. He's asking about internationalization and using web fonts on sites that don't use Western character sets. And that actually came up with somebody I was speaking with last night going into the party where he was dealing with a website for in the game industry that had to deal with a lot of different languages, um, double byte languages like uh, Japanese or Korean, Chinese, and there are actually some great ways to handle that. So you can use a Unicode character set that will cover all your Western languages. And you can also use a service like fonts.com can dynamically subset Japanese typefaces. So even though it would be several megabytes to use the full font, they can actually do that on the fly. So you can still use great typefaces and that have them work in many, many languages. Um, and all of that encoding can be handled by the service itself. So. There's st just because you have to support other languages doesn't mean you, you shouldn't use web fonts. On, on the contrary, that can carry your brand voice in ways that you otherwise could not on that small screen and still deliver a great performance and experience for your, for your audience. Yeah. Are you first? Um, yeah, that's actually another really great question. So um, the question was about choosing web fonts. And what I always tell designers is anytime you start the process of selecting a typeface, it has to be connected in some way, either stylistically or thematically or historically to the project you're working on, but it has to be available. So you need to check the services and make sure that the licensing is available to use it online. That should be a non-starter. Don't even bring it to the table if you can't find it available on Typekit, FontDeck, um, Fonts.com, self-hosting licenses from my fonts. There's, it's, they're available in so many places, it's just inexcusable to not answer that question first. But tens of thousands are available for, for use. 
either through a service or uh, to self-host on your own site with a proper license. So um, there's really no excuse. The only thing that is inexcusable is using Font Squirrel to make it yourself because that is a violation of the license of any typeface that's not open source and it's just bad practice. We don't want people stealing our work. We shouldn't be stealing somebody else's. Well, I think that's the beautiful thing about design. Uh, I mean, with any kind of art, rules are there to be broken. And if it's right for the project, then do it. I think you just have to have a reason. I mean, again, like everything should be in your design for a reason. And if it supports the intended use, the consumption of that content, then, then it's the right thing to do. It's hard for me to see further in the back. I just want to make sure I'm getting people back there before I keep... Whoever he's pointing to, go ahead. <laughs> well, there's always a cricket bat. Um, I don't know why I chose that, but um, well, I I think you know hyphenation is still really tricky on the web, and they all come at a cost. So you can add the CSS in there to allow it, but it's only going to work in some of the browsers some of the time. And if you have a lot of other things going on, adding a performance hit of another JavaScript library to add it may not be the right answer either. So in many cases, it's just not widely supported enough. So I think in those cases, what I would do is put it in the code anyway. And, and then when the hyphenation works, it works. Um, but you're not penalizing anybody by adding like 100K worth of hyphenation dictionary to download, which is quite a big penalty just to satisfy our own desire for a better rag on the right. Yeah, actually, you know, that was, um, I debated adding that one in as another step. You're asking about maximum line length. Um, that is a, that is a real concern and it's just crazy easy for you to implement just a max width and a number of M's. So typically to get around a 70 to 80 character line length, you could say a max width of say 37 to 38 M's. And that relative measure will scale with the type. And that way, even if there's a little extra room in your design, you can set this with different breakpoints to see what, you, what really works. Then um, even if there's a little extra margin on the right, then your paragraphs won't get unreadably long. But it, it's a very worthwhile thing to add. All the way in the back. Lazy? No, I'm sorry. That was a very flippant answer. Um, Facebook does this all the time. When you open that up, you see sort of like little gray boxes where the content will be. Um, I kind of fundamentally have a problem with putting something that's not content where the content should be. So my take on that is handle it by using that fallback trick so that you can just display the content. Because it's there already. That's the first thing that loads. The HTML is going to load before that other little gray box graphic will be there. So why not have the content come in and just let it be in the fallback font? You can use in that the code for the Google Web Font Loader gives you an asynchronous flag. So you can say async equals true. And that way the page can go on its rendering business while it goes and fetches that web font. And it doesn't interrupt that, that load process at all. So uh, to me, that's the better answer is get the content on the screen so the user can start to take it in and then bring the style in, in the least obtrusive way you can. Every day. Every day. Um, there, there's, there are many. I mean, it's hard to, to kind of narrow it down and say that there's, there's just one. I mean, oftentimes, it may be a great site. You know, I, I talk about Medium a lot because I think they do a lot of things right. Um, it drives me nuts that they stop short of breaking the underline and the link for the descenders. I think that's a real bummer because it's, I think it's a more beautiful way to do it and I don't think there's a big penalty for the user. I think it would have been, I know they had their reasons, but I, like, I would prefer to do it that way. 
um, I think that kind of completes the experience a little bit more. Um, I also think that uh, it's not very often considered, uh, especially in responsive sites, this is something I've written about a lot, where you see the, the page get small, but they don't change the scale of the headers. So you end up with like an H1 with one word per line. It's really awkward break. So I think proportion with varying screen size is probably the most overlooked thing right now. Um, that I you'd want to see people think about that more. Um, that actually brings me back to something else that's up on GitHub in that repo is a set of SAS files that I've pulled together called, it's the RWT scaffold um, repository there. It's a set of SAS files that brings in everything from my book, all of the different little tips and tricks, things I've talked about today, um, into one repository that you could bring those partials into your own project and then kind of tweak them from there and bring a lot of this stuff into your own project pretty easily. So definitely check that out. It'll save you a bunch of time in pulling these things together. Go ahead. Um, favorite font for mobile, you know, I don't actually, um, because there are a lot of really beautiful ones. I think the challenge is to pick ones that will be perhaps a little bit narrower so that you can preserve a decent line length but n I, without having to make the type size smaller. I think that's often the, th the mistake people make is on small screens, they actually start to make it smaller than 1M. Now when I say 1M, I mean that's 100%. So font size 100%, leave it that way because device makers put a lot of time and effort into figuring out what that 100% size is physically based on the resolution and operating system and the quality of the screen. So you'll notice that physically it may differ slightly from what we get used to on the desktop, which is an equivalent of 16 pixels, which is kind of meaningless now too with high-res screens. But um, generally speaking, whatever it is at 100%, test it on small screens and make sure that it's going to give you a readable line. So there are plenty of serif typefaces that will still work well. Um, I really like Trade Gothic. That actually is a fairly narrow one that renders well. An open source one is Fira Sans. That's really nice. Um, that was designed for the Firefox OS by Eric Speakerman and another fellow. Um, that's a, a really nice one to experiment with and free, so it's even better. Um, one in the back there. None. Real content. Laura Mipsum's a poser. The, I, I'm, I'm, I, know, I know it sounds funny, but it's true. It's, it's too predictable. All of them are. You need natural language and natural breaks to really get an understanding of what's going to happen on these screens. So even if it's not final copy, you need real copy. Don't ever design with Laura Mipsum. I, it was like a joke to myself to actually use it here because I never let it get into a design ever. Um, it's just not going to give you a real understanding of how your design is going to behave. Anyone else? Mm. Right. Um, that's a that's a great question, and it's actually something I was just talking about with the team from Salesforce because they have exactly that problem. And the things to consider are you need something that's fairly narrow, so you might want to look at a typeface that has a condensed weight so that you can look at that and, and sort of fit more things, but you don't want to use a typeface like, uh, like a sort of severe geometric one like Helvetica. The problem is, and this isn't to bash on Helvetica, whether or not I like it, um, is that those numerals at small sizes are incredibly hard to differentiate. Really difficult to know what's a 6 and a 9 or a 3 and an 8, and those are critical things when you're trying to read data. That could be a 50% error in whatever you're reading. So um, it has to be one, I, I tend to think it's probably one with lining figures, meaning all the, the numbers line up rather than the mixed case old style figures. Um, because I think that would be too jarring. Um, but I think generally that's what you want to start with a nice clean sans serif that has a condensed weight and, and just see how that will work. So your, your letters can be more condensed but still allow for a little white space around them.
Yeah, um, yeah, we've had some interesting experience. So the question was about accessibility, um, and there's you know there's a couple of different things at play. Um, one is the shape of the letters themselves. So uh, we worked on a website for a school that had a very high percentage population of children with dyslexia, and one of the things that we found in our research was that um, finding typefaces that had a greater level of differentiation between similar characters was really the key to better readability there. Um, so a B and a D, a P and a Q, in many typefaces, they're almost identical. So you really have to look for one that has a greater level of differentiation. So that's one thing. Um, another one is contrast. So interestingly enough, um, the stated requirement in the United States of 508 compliance states that you need an 85% level of contrast. I may be misquoting that a little bit, but that's generally what they're saying. And that's almost black and white. And it's really stark and a little jarring. So a lot of people go with a lesser amount of contrast. And interestingly enough, I spoke with a bunch of people who actually have some of these uh, contrast sensing issues. And that 85% was too harsh for them. They actually had an easier time with only about 60% contrast between the light and the dark values. So finding a middle ground and then testing it with your intended audience is probably the best thing that you can do. Um, but then again, also that gets at use a relative unit of measure, an M is what I typically go with. Um, I don't use REMS because the only time you get in trouble with M's is if you set your font sizing on the container and not the font element itself. So that's a bit of a tangent, but um, whatever the relative element is, you want to build everything around that. So if somebody needs to make the text bigger, Command Plus will zoom the whole page, trigger your breakpoints, preserve the integrity of the design, it all stays together. That's probably one of the most important accessibility things you can do, is make sure that everything behaves as it should, as expected, as it resizes. So because that's how a lot of people deal with it. They add their own style sheet, and, and they, they zoom. And, and so that gives them the control that they need. Go ahead. Right. Well, you know, again, um, I think that does come back to uh, setting up your design and your code around relative units so that on, on one website you might want to zoom out, but it'll preserve the, the integrity of that design because everything's based on percentages and M's. And then if your parents need to zoom in, they can do that as well. And by doing that in smaller increments, just with the way the browser works on its own, then everything will scale with it, and it should stay usable for them. And, and that way, I, I think that's about the best that we can do. Now, there are things like readability and other ways of handling it. I think that's kind of a cop-out. I think that's a poor substitute for doing your job right in the first place to make sure that everything can hold up. Um, but that's, I think, about as much as we can do, unfortunately. And one more? All the way in the back. <laughs> um, you know, I only have four. And to be perfectly honest, I would love for these books to go to students who have asked questions. So I know there's one guy right there in about the fifth row back, but... Um, you know, you can get these for about $12 or $13 for the Kindle edition on Amazon. I'm perfectly happy with you buying them at a big discount, but I want students to have this stuff to work with. So I, I have to say, anybody who's like currently enrolled, then um, I would love to give some of these away. Well, we have time for one more, or I think we, we may be done. Thank you very much. You've been amazing.